bendiciones, que lo que es mi gente, this is another edition of Hispaniola History Channel with your brother David Rodriguez and this is Native Elites, Indigenous Conquistadors and Slave Masters. Question, who were the Native Elites? Was slavery practiced in America before the arrival of the Spanish? With the Spanish first arriving in small numbers, how was Spain able to conquer nearly half of the Western Hemisphere and the Philippines? Were the Mayans ever involved in collaborating with the Spanish crown in colonizing the Americas? Who was really responsible for the institution of slavery in America during the early Spanish colonial period? We are gonna find out in this episode of Hispaniola History Channel. Stay tuned. Dímelo. Oh yeah, this is the Hispaniola History Channel. La Historia de Hispaniola, presented by David Rodriguez. Slavery, Conquest, and the Black Legend. As covered in previous episodes, we're trying to chip away in this concept of the black legend. Most or if not all of the blame of slavery in the early colonial period is put on Spain and on Spanish people. And also the myth of thousands of Spanish soldiers arriving and conquering the Americas. We always get the images of massive boats and massive armies of Spanish soldiers coming here and plundering the Americas. But did that really happen? Spanish enslavering and conquering Indians. We always get these images of Spanish soldiers enslaving Indians and putting them into chains. But is this a real accurate account of history? Uh, the Mayans and other powerful indigenous nations always portrayed as victim. Powerful nations that somehow crumbled under the presence of the Spanish. Is this true? The purpose of this presentation is to discuss who were the native elites, to also discuss slavery as it was practiced by Native Americans before the arrival of Europeans. The allied native armies and Indian conquistadors. Who were these people? Of course, we have accurate accounts of a Pacific, a trans-Pacific slave trade. And before we get into who were the native elites and their role in conquest and slavery in the Americas, let's recap previous episode, Protector of the Indians. Spain initially viewed themselves as the guardians of the Indians. The church and the court system advocated for the liberation of native Tainos. And it was Montesinos, not La Casas, who first advocated for the liberation of Native Americans. Counts of Caribs raiding islands, kidnapping and enslaving Tainos. And of course, we talked about the illegal slavery going on in Mexico. While there is a push to end the practice in Hispaniola. <coughs> the pre-Columbian native elite class of America. Here we're going from a primary source of Fray Bernardo de Sahagún, a general history of things of New Spain, book eight, quoting from that source, it says here, they were rewarded according to their merits. The ruler accorded favors to all, costly capes, breech clouts, chocolate, food, and devices, and labyrinths and earplugs. Even more did the ruler accord favors to the princes if they had taken captives. He gave them the offices of stewards and all wealth without price, honor, fame, and renown. So there's a quote here talking about some elite classes of Native Americans who not only a ruling class, but also partaking in some kind of slavery. There's a mention of captives here. Let's go more into this. Of course, there's this famous painting of the three mulattoes of Esmeraldas. 1599 so they are portraying a look of uh, some kind of indigenous tribe here in the americas but they also have spanish surnames and look very wealthy and the use of the word mulatto is very interesting because as you can see is denoting some kind of mixed ancestry here nonetheless they look wealthy and they were part of the elite here in the americas of course the story of Anna Kaona, here's an image here of her being carried by some of her servants 
as we know, there was always a hierarchy or a, a sort of social status for certain Native Americans who were either in the Caribbean or the mainland. Anna Kaono came from that class of ruling class of natives in the Caribbean. Here's a painting of Montezuma meeting Cortez for the first time. This painting is well known. It was actually painted by a native person of Mexico. But what's interesting about this painting, uh, Montezuma is surrounded by Native Americans. And he has a different look that's different from the natives that he's surrounded by. Now, certain things on this painting and in this interaction between Cortez and Montezuma. That in which we're going to cover a little bit later. But we just want to point out that there was an elite class of Native Americans here in the Americas. There was a social order. There was slavery before the arrival of Columbus. So slavery was practiced by Native Americans before the arrival of Europeans. Uh, here we have a source, how Native American slaveholders complicated the Trail of Tears narrative, a Smithsonian Magazine, Ryan Smith, March 2018. It highlights that some Native Americans were captured and sold by others into slavery and sold to Europeans. Here's another source, Introduction, Indian Slavery in Historical Context, Indian Slavery in Colonial America, Lincoln University of Nebraska Press, pages 1 through 32. It highlights how Native Americans specifically took slaves from other Native American groups and therefore view them as ethnically inferior. In some cases, Native American slaves were allowed to live on the fringes of Native American society until they were slowly integrated into the tribe. Here's another source, Cuba Immigration and Immigration by Jose C. Moya, the Encyclopedia of Global Human Migration, edited by Emmanuel Ness, has some information on the history of Cuba and it talks about the Caribs. It says here the Caribs, another group from northern Venezuela and Lesser Antilles, began raiding Cuba for women after 1200 CE, although apparently this type of migration did not lead to permanent settlements. So it talks about some kind of raids going on in Cuba by the Caribs. That's where the Tainos inhabited. Despite the numerous accounts of slavery practiced by the indigenous before the arrival of the Spanish, no records exist on whether or not Indians who were enslaved by other Indians ever received payment or wages for their labor. Um, but one thing that the Spanish did implement insisted on wages to be paid to Native Americans for their labor. Uh, so I just want to make a note on that. Of course, the Taino Arawak Alliance with the Spanish nobles during these Carib Wars, this is where the movement to abolish Indian slavery occurred in the island of Hispaniola and we cover the illegal slavery in Mexico. So what we're going to get into is some of these Indian allies of the Spanish during these wars in Mexico. From Mexico, the Spanish and Indian allies conquered the Americas and parts of Asia. So we're going to get into some sources to verify this. Allied armies and the conquest of Mesoamerica. Here we have a source, uh, the Ancient Maya, 6th edition, written by Robert Scherer, Stanford, California, the University Press, page 763. It talks about how thousands of auxiliary Indians participated and collaborated with the Spaniards. As the expedition of Pedro de Alvarado to Guatemala was composed of 480 Spaniards and thousands of auxiliary Indians from Texcala, Ochalula, and other cities in central Mexico. Another source here, Matthew Ristall and Florine Azelberg's The Invading of Guatemala, The Mayans' Accounts of the Conquest Wars, Pennsylvania State University Press, page 16. It talks about uh, 30 indigenous warriors for every one Spaniard. That was the count. So for every one Spaniard, you have at least 30 indigenous soldiers. It says it's estimated that for every Spaniard on the field of battle, there were at least 10 native auxiliaries. Sometimes there were as many as 30 indigenous warriors for every Spaniard. It was the participating of these Mesoamerican allies that was particularly decisive was the reason why the Spanish were so successful in the colonization of the Americas. This is half of the hemisphere here we're talking about. 
right? They couldn't have done it alone. Here's an image, a page from uh, the 16th century Lienzo de Tezcala reproduction of an 1892 painting showing the Spanish conquest of Guatemala. And of course the Spaniards stood out from the natives by the use of the horses, the Spanish garbs, and the beard. One Spaniard is surrounded by Native Americans while they war with other Native Americans. And one thing I want to make note of is we always get these stories of the Spanish conquering the Americas using these advanced weaponry. But here we have an image of the conquest of Guatemala where the Spanish are merely on a horse using a spear, right? There is no advanced weaponry here. The advanced weaponry is the vast number of Native Americans that help the Spanish. So that has to be made clear, all right? That should paint a clear picture in terms of exactly what happened there was no advanced weaponry there was just native americans versus other native americans here with the source indian conquistadors indigenous allies in the conquest of mesoamerica edited by laura e matthew and michael r e Dujic, uh, university of oklahoma press uh, we have an image here of a map the utilization of Indio conquistadors and Spanish expedition of the conquest of New Spain from 1519 to 1620. So showing some expeditions and where the Indian conquistadors were allied with the Spanish. The most elite of all the Native Americans were the Mayans. They had an already existing network of trade, including slavery of other natives. Did the Mayans also assist the Spanish in the conquest of the Americas and possibly Asia? We have a source here, the La Historia Social de los Quinches, Guatemala City, Guatemala, pages 39 of page 40, written by Robert Carmack. Uh, it says here that the Mayan groups remained loyal to the Spanish and provided them with warriors to assist further conquest. So there were some Mayan groups who were loyal to the Spanish and were providing the Spanish with plenty of warriors. Of course, there were books written on this. One good source for this is the book written by Matthew Ristall titled Maya Conquistador. I actually own this book and I'll be going into some of the passages of this book. It actually tells the conquest of the Americas from the Mayan perspective. So it's a very interesting read. Exploring first-hand accounts written by Maya nobles from the 16th through the 19th centuries, many of them previously untranslated, Ristal offers the first Maya account of the conquest. The story holds surprising twists. The conquistadors were not only Spaniards, but also Mayas, reconstructing their own governance and society. And the Spanish colonization of the Yucatan was part of an ongoing pattern of adaptation and survival for centuries. So it speaks on the so-called Spanish conquest from a Mayan perspective. Again, I'll be reading from this book in future episodes, but I know for a surety that the Mayans did participate and help the Spaniards in the colonization of the Americas. Back to the previous source, Indian Conquistadors, page 14. Indian Conquistadors and how they traveled to Florida, Cuba, and Hispaniola in service of the Spanish crown. Top of page 14 in the second paragraph, it says here, Guatemala was not the only destination in New Spain for the Indian conquistadors. There are reports of native groups traveling as far south as El Salvador and as far north as Santa Fe, New Mexico. Charles Gibson speculates that the Tixacala may have traveled to Florida in 1559 and to Havana, Cuba and Santo Domingo in 1583. Again with the same source, Indian conquistadors. It speaks on the Japanese and American Indians used during the conquest of the Philippines. Let's read. It says, the Maya brought by Alvarado to the Andes were surely not the only Mesoamericans to die on Spanish ships in the Pacific Ocean. A 1624 request for a pension by a Spanish veteran, the wars of conquest in the Philippines claimed that in a 1603 campaign against bloodthirsty Chinese Chinos, meaning Philippine natives, the Spanish force included some Japanese and Indians. 
that these Indians may have been Mesoamericans is strongly suggested by a petition preserved in the same volume in the imperial archives in Seville. So here you have accounts of uh, Japanese and Indians, American Indians going into the Philippines, assisting the Spanish in conquering the Philippines. So as we know, Mexico was the hub for slaves brought into the Americas from Asia and the Pacific Islands. While Hispaniola was moving towards ending slavery, who was keeping slavery alive in Mexico? Or what was keeping slavery alive in Mexico? Here's a source that I read from in previous episodes, Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico by Tatiana Cejeras. Uh, page 45, it speaks how the native elites and illegal slavery in Mexico went hand in hand. Uh, second paragraphs, it talks about the prohibition of indigenous slavery. In other words, only pertain to Spaniards, not Indian elites. There was a push to end Indian slavery. So these laws apply to the Spanish nobles, but it did not apply to the Indian elites. Moving down to the other paragraphs, as the drive to abolish indigenous slavery failed because the Spanish government relied on Indian chiefs for food and stability. And the chiefs in turn depended heavily on slaves. So while the Spanish relied on the Indian chiefs, it was the Indian chiefs that had the slaves. Moving on to page 46, it talks about the indigenous chiefs were the masters of slavery in Mexico. Let's read it says the native elites were committed to the continuation of slavery because the institution was directly related to their political position, social rank and economic power. Native elites rightly understood that the abolition of indigenous slavery would diminish their standing and socioeconomic hierarchy. The elites owned slaves in proportion to their nobility so that the most powerful had upward of a hundred slaves. Native chiefs were known, for instance, to walk around Manila with a large entourage of slaves who held silk parasols to protect them from the sun. So let's hold it right there. We have accounts of native chiefs walking around with hundreds of slaves. Of course, that takes us back to the image of Montezuma. Montezuma was a native elite surrounded by slaves holding up a silk parasol protecting him from the sun. So when we hear about the native elites providing the Spanish with slaves and even soldiers, people like Montezuma come to mind and there were a few Montezuma-like characters in the Americas that the Spanish collaborated with. So when we talk about the enslavement of Native Americans and capture and purchase of Native Americans, it was these Native elites that were ones who were actually perpetuating and wanting to keep the institution of slavery alive. At the same time, the Spanish are trying to abolish it in places like Hispaniola and the surrounding islands. So here we have a conflict of interest in which the Spanish crown is trying to abolish slavery you have these chiefs who had a whole industry of slavery going and they'll try and keep it going so they can keep their wealth and status in the Americas. So to summarize and recap what we just have learned, we learned that slavery was practiced in mass numbers before the Spanish and Columbus arriving in the Americas. And at times based on racial and ethnic differences among warring tribes. So you can actually call that a kind of racism among Native Americans. And that was the basis of their slavery. Before the Spanish arrived, the Caribs were kidnapping and enslaving Taino women from Cuba. Mexico was a major market for purchasing slaves, illegal slaves. The indigenous of America who greatly outnumbered the Spanish and whose armies numbered into the thousands assisted Spain in the colonization of America. The Native elites and Indian chiefs were the biggest enslavers of other Indians and Asians, and their wealth and status depended on it. They were the first ones to sell natives as slaves to Europeans. So they were the masters of this industry. So as the facts about Indian slavery and the conquest of America only leads to more questions. Why were the Mayans and other powerful indigenous nations willing to join the Spanish crown? What was going on in the Americas before the arrival of the Spanish that might have contributed to some Indian tribes converting to Christianity? So what was going on in the Americas? So I hope you enjoyed this presentation, Native Elites, Indigenous Conquistadors, 
and slave masters. Powerful information here, and it does prove that there was a huge institution of slavery going on in the Americas prior and during the so-called Spanish conquest. And it was the natives themselves that were the number one collaborators with the Spanish. And one of those groups being the Mayans. And that's something we'll get into a little bit more in future episodes. But for now, this is your brother David Rodriguez with another episode of Hispaniola History Channel. Good night and God bless. Peace.